So this is one dimensional likelihood curve um, that describes R, the likelihood for R, or the tensor scalar ratio. Zero means no gravitational waves. Um, so without any subtraction, the bicep two likelihood curve peaks around here, okay? With subtraction, the bicep two curve becomes this. So that's the likelihood curve like this, move down a little bit, not dramatically, okay? That's this uh, light uh, gray curve. And we also added a Keck data, uh, which is uh, similar uh, data, but with much better uh, sensitivity. So that produces a likelihood curve that's consistent with the bicep two likelihood curve, uh, but it moves uh, the likelihood uh, toward the left or smaller tensor, even. Okay, um, and the combination of the two uh, is this solid curve, likelihood curve. So zero point two doesn't look very likely uh, anymore. So that means we definitely have seen dust. Okay, in the original bicep two. Uh, data. So first of all, Keck largely confirmed what bicep 2 sees. But we've definitely seen dust uh, in the original bicep 2. So that's why 0 0.2 is no longer um, alive uh, at this point. Um, so the unfortunately effect of throwing in a noisy dust template is um, even though the likelihood curve didn't move that much really, but you added a lot of noise. That means zero is no longer ruled out with uh, large confidence anymore. <coughs> we can no longer say we've detected tensor at this point. In fact, you know, since last May, we started stop saying that, and that's what we said uh, in the paper we published in June. Okay, we no longer claim that with current data uh, there is strong evidence for tensor. Uh, or after the subtraction, you know, the peak likelihood curve didn't change that much. But zero is a viable explanation now. But we're experimentalists. We're trying to, um, you know, test different theories. So if you look at it from that perspective, it's incredibly exciting. Um, so I listed um, the prediction of, um, I marked predictions of uh, three uh, compelling uh, inflationary models, okay? Um, First one is uh, M squared phi squared. It's a minimal inflation model. You just have an input time potential that looks like a parabola, and you can inflate, and it explains mostly most everything we observe. So that's the simplest possible model, as well as the level of scalar perturbation. So it's almost a model with no parameters, no free parameters, just one single parameter that was fixed by the level of scalar perturbation. So that's slightly disfavors, some said more so, uh, but because it's such a simple model, I don't think it's completely ruled out. I don't think we should apply it to completely rule it out. Uh, and there are some inflation, um, sorry, string motivated, motivated uh, inflationary models like uh, axiom monotropy here, predicting R of 0.07 with more digits that follows. And there is the so-called Starobinsky model that has a Lagrangian where it turns in addition to R, okay? Um, and that predicts R of three times 10 to minus three or something. Um, so now where we are is we observe at 150 gigahertz, we combine with quant measurement at 350, 353, and soon we'll be able to distinguish these models or potentially pick out one of the three models, three very compelling models. Um, if we s okay. yeah, um, when you combine to, with your arrows, with your three models, yeah. right. now what would be the experiment constraint concerning the mean sigmas based upon the scalar analysis on these three? Uh, scalar analysis from the scalar perturbation. I mean, from the standard CMB. Yeah. So this. For the M square, phi square, this. Okay. So I think Planck indeed published a paper. Shortly after our joint paper, probably still being reviewed, I'm sure it is. Um, but they threw in uh, constraints from.
from scalar, which is similar to this one, as well as this direct uh, BMO constraint. And that moves this line a little bit that way. So that's why some people, you know, if you take, if, if you pick, if you're serious about, you know, combining everything you've got, uh, M squared phi squared is now, you know, disfavored. You know, it's not ruled out as three sigma, I don't think, uh, but it's disfavored as two-ish sigma. Okay. Uh, but this is, this likelihood curve is the direct likelihood curve for um, all the issues. Okay. So indeed, you know, if you're a theorist trying to make your bet, I, 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 it's looking unlikely. Now, uh, because you commented before, not that I'm pushing for a cyclic model or whatever, but that was the one you mentioned without prediction for transit perturbation. So with that kind of coming back to the game? Well, um, so I mean, it's, it's a theoretical question. Yeah, in principle, yes. If you have a model, whenever, you know, the next question is whether it's a self consistent model. But if you have a model you know, that predicts R and R minus 6, yeah, it's still consistent with the, the experiment, yeah. yeah. So another important point to remark is we've already measured this patch to depth, basically, at 150 gigahertz. So this is small arrow is the level of bicep 2 check contribution to this likelihood curve. So this is the full width, okay, which is much larger than the contribution from by the string tech. Where is the noise coming from? Where is the uncertainty coming from? It's from the subtraction of dust. So, you know, we're forced to subtract the dust because we can no longer claim it's negligible. Once we do that, you know, you introduce a lot of noise uh, in the likelihood curve, this, this bike. Okay, but that also says, um, you know, there is a crystal clear path forward, right? So we use this method. We measure with high fidelity degree scale BMO polarization on this guy. And we have this tantalizing likelihood curve that's about to distinguish these three extremely important models, okay? So if we just stay the course and we reduce the noise on dust, if we figure out how to do that, by making our own measurements at 200 gigahertz, 300 gigahertz on the ground, or we can just observe at lower frequency, such that when you scale the Planck dust template, you know, for subtraction, so you scale the template dust template by a factor before you subtract, right? If that factor is smaller because you observe your CMB at a lower frequency, then the contribution of that absolute level as well as uncertainty will reduce by a large factor, okay? And all of this, you know, is within grasp, okay? So, since we've seen something in the map before we even publish, we decided to put uh, two receivers, okay? At, 90, at, at 95 or 100 gigahertz in a Keck array. So Keck array is a copy of bicycle multiple times, you just pull two receivers out and put in two 150 gigahertz receivers out and put in two 100 gigahertz receivers, trying to, uh, to have some weight on the low frequency measurement, okay? And that's the EMO polarization we saw out here. Uh, we haven't published the BMO yet. And we have that data for a year now. And even more significantly, we deployed a whole new experiment just a few months ago we achieved first light in January, um, and uh, that will have another 2,000 100 gigahertz effect. Okay, so at 100 gigahertz, the contribution from dust uh, is a factor of six smaller compared to 150 gigahertz. And remember how close we are to distinguish to distinguishing the three models. We can just shrink that error by a factor of two even. Um, then all of a sudden you might just zoom in as one of the models, okay? Um, so if you're still confused about acronyms, so bicep one is done, bicep two is done, okay? Bicep one uses uh, hand-assembled detectors, bicep two uses uh, printed lithographic 
uh, superconductive detectors, and Keck just copied BICEP two five times, uh, and now Keck <coughs> is observing with two 220 gigahertz and two uh, 95 gigahertz receivers. Uh, so you know it'll tell us more about <coughs> the program, and we just deployed BICEP three, uh, which had the, all of the sensitivity of the entire Keck array in a much smaller platform. So next we're going to produce an array of this, of course. So we we'll see this pattern. So we're just talking about more and more and more of detectors. So that's the name of the game here, OK? And especially after we have established the methodology uh, in, uh, in Bicep in 2 for degree scale demo polarization, polarization mm -hmm. which was thought to be impossible 10 years ago from the ground or even in space. So <laughs> I spent most of the past three years Building this uh, bicep three experiment, so I spent two minutes on it. So from bicep two to bicep three was pain. So you have to scale it up by a factor of two. It's easier to do it, and well, it works. But then you know the transmitted radiation goes up by a factor of five. Then you have to reject. You have to have better infrared rejection uh, while cooling a much bigger focal plane at the same temperature. Pictures taken a few months ago, five foot three mm -hmm. being tested in North America uh, before we ship it to South Pole in 40 crates with a lot of organization, um, execution, um, in addition to being smart or good with physics. So finally, by foot three arriving at the South Pole. Uh, this doesn't look like South Pole <laughs> because uh, we we're now smart to just impose completely our experiment in indoor, leaving <laughs> only the window out in the cold. Otherwise, you will fail. Okay, no matter what you do, um, and that same receiver is now observing. So very soon, you know, this is all saturated, of course. So temperature fluctuation like this, you know, is a Nobel Prize winning measurement 20 years ago, but now we do it in minutes. And it's actually there. Is there a reason why you put this picture upside down? Oh, just to match up with the convention we had. Oh, because we were yelled at by a few astronomers. Um, <laughs> that we're supposed to put uh, yeah, and also uh, they're pretty insistent about the direction of uh, right ascension. Uh, I mean, astronomers. Um, but you know, we're getting used to it because all these structures, which we've been mapping since 2003, have names already. So you know, this is Mervay here. This is Mervay. So we're seeing them. That's exciting. So this is the mass you have to cool to 0.2 Kelvin. Okay. With a window bigger than this. So we're going to populate all of this with detectors. So first year we had nine. Next year we're going to populate the rest of it. All at 95. OK. Ran out of time. But expect more great things about, you know, BMO polarization from this collaboration. Very soon, uh, we're going to publish our Keck 95 gigahertz measurements. So we have a year of data on it already. Again, at a frequency much less sensitive to dust. We don't quite have the same sensitivity um, as, uh, as at 150 yet, but that should still be very interesting. And uh, like I said earlier, Bicep 3 has achieved first light. You know, I show it in two slides. It was a struggle, like hard work. For the past three years, and just the nightmarish work for the past four months. Okay. Um, and um, I'm hoping that we get some sort of result by the end of this year. 
have this too optimistic, but uh, definitely by the by middle <coughs> of next year. We'll get some results. Um, so as you've seen already, Pfizer check at 150 gigahertz cross pump is limited by noise on dust template. Uh, and um, going to 95 gigahertz uh, with check and with Pfizer Q, it will be less limited by noise. Um, but one day, you know, we'll ultimately be limited by dust again, assuming we don't see a booming signal in 10 years. Okay? So the way to get around that is to increase the sky coverage to improve statistics or to improve noise on dust template by making high frequency measurements on the ground, okay, before we get a billion dollar satellite mission funded, uh, or, um, and if we see something soon um, that doesn't look like dust, that's, you know, degree scale beam polarization, we want to know whether it's synchrotronic, okay? So we want to measure low frequency uh, beam mode. Um, that's not currently known very well, uh, which is easy on the ground. But in summary, uh, we do expect, please, um, we do expect another round of upgrades. Um, now focusing on expanding sky, uh, instead of sky coverage, uh, frequency coverage. So when we see something, then we'll expand the sky coverage to uh, improve on the statistics. But the main message is the entire method is you know well established. We're still still ahead of our competitor uh, for about for mm -hmm. three years, if not more, and uh, soon we'll be able to distinguish those three models matter of a few months or a year or two. Thank you. Hi, I just have one question. So how do you determine the frequency you're choosing to observe the sky? So there are two maps, two, two diagrams that I should draw, or should I be included in my talk, really. So frequency, so this is the amount of uh, uh, contamination, okay? Okay, so this is uh, dust, and this is uh, synchrotron. This is about 80, 90 gigahertz. Yeah. Um, this was not very well known. The degree of polarization was not well known. The dependence is quite well known. Okay. Um, so not just us. Uh, most of the experiments in this field um, chose 150 gigahertz because uh, most of us thought dust is polarized at most at 5% level, given the optical. Now we know it's polarized more. Uh, so that moves the optimal frequency down uh, from 100, 150 gigahertz to perhaps 80 gigahertz. But first of all, you want to avoid you know, astronomical uh, program. And then on the ground, there is a uh, sky opacity. Okay? So and it goes like this. There's a very broad line at 60, 70 gigahertz. Okay, so this is about 50, 40. And then there's a window around 90. <coughs> there's a water line here. And there's a window at about 150. And then just a bunch of forest of lines that make, ultimately makes it opaque in the far infrared. So on the ground, you can observe it 45, 90, 150, and pretty much nothing else. So that we're limited, we have limited window on the ground. Okay. Uh, and also, it becomes very difficult to observe this portion on the ground. So for example, <coughs> here in Taipei, it goes to 100%. <laughs> <laughs> But even in Atacama, 
150 becomes very uh, somehow opaque in, in certainty and in polite. Okay. So the higher the frequency is, you know, the more demanding on the site it becomes. So I wouldn't want to observe it 200 gigahertz even in Atacama in Chile, for example. Uh, even at the South Pole, it becomes you know, challenging. Yeah, but we're limited by these two things. And you know the minima is around here, around here. So in space, all of this goes away. So you're going to have overlapping you know, 15 bands to go. So given the ground-based technology like in the say, next decade or so, and also all this lucky window for the frequencies, do you see there's a lower bound of the detection? Well, based on the smallest value of R, you can think visually. We can quickly reach R 0.01 in three years. How about 10 to the minus minus 3, can you? 10 to the minus 3 is harder. 10 to the minus 3 is harder. Because um, the lensing uh, signal has a contribution given its degree scale. Right. And that comes in at R 0 0.01, 0 0.02. Okay. Um, so when you reach that level, we not only have to get rid of all programs. Now we know how to prepare this fraction of the factor of many. Okay. We also have to de-lens. We have to you know, understand the lensing map uh, to de-lens. So if that's a series, you want a number to shoot for, like the Kukam one or two. <laughs> so to, to be like you know feasibly experimentally. <laughs> right. So in a in a computer study, we ask uh, 10 to minus three. I think 10 to minus three is going to be very hard. Point oh one, you know, we can give you that. Just give some check, five percent check here. Uh, it just occurred to me that um, when you have two consecutive tone sense scattered, you can create demo. Uh, two consecutive scat scattering by uh, scattering. Scatter and so uh, the first scattering is all, of course, from CMB uh, origin at, uh, at uh, Z equal to 1,300. Yeah. And the second scattering is at the deionization. Yeah. And that, that is a uh, large scale. Yeah. So will this, uh, this second scattering uh, contaminate demo? It's not a contamination. If you don't have tensor, the second sc scattering will only cause emo. No. Then no. That's why I say two no, no, consecutive no, no, scattering. You didn't, you didn't understand what I just said. So if you have R of zero, then the second scattering causes emo only, no emo. Right. It's a very well known fact now. Right, right, right. That's why I say two consecutive. I mean, right. a photon scatter once and a second. Yes. And scatter a second time. Yes. And so uh, that, would it be a second, um, higher than a second order effect? It's a second order effect. It's very well known. If you run CMB fast, it's in there. It produces a peak uh, at L of seven. Okay? No, that, that, that's the first scatter. No, that no, no. Is, uh, that's the second scatter. That's the second scatter. Yeah, but that is not. That is not a two consecutive scatter. So you do you want um, another scatter? Oh, then then it becomes very small, right? So do you want to scatter it twice at reionization? Right. Uh -huh. So that, that's two scattering, right? So one at recombination, one re at reionization. That's right. Same same photon scatter twice. Same photon scatter twice. That that will create uh, a beam. Of. Okay. I, I mean, we can talk it. Yeah. About it all time. Don't think, uh, yeah, but I mean, you're not talking about the well-known realization. Well, no, no, yeah. I'm not talking about that. Yeah, that's right. I mean, for the well-known processes, there's no, no such time, but uh, it's also known that, for example, the algorithm scenario of the custom strings, you can actually create this um, couple of the electron pairs to generate the demo. But um, yeah, I don't see that as a contamination. It's, yeah. it's even more exotic. It's just from different secondary pieces of processes. I guess the key point is what a single photon scatter twice. That, that that's what I mean. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Okay. More questions?
if you if you can put some some facts about the recruitment of the PhD student. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we are initiating. No, not yet. Okay. Could you comment on some uh, possible secondary observation? In so there are two um, two big ones. One in New York called Core or Core Plus. Um, had a few tries. I don't think any were, were successful. I think there was decline most recently, less than a month ago. The most recent attempt. Basically, the talk. Lightbird is a much smaller uh, experiment um, targeting only degree scale demobilization from inflation. It doesn't have enough angular resolution to also see the lending part and core would have um, enough resolution to do both. Um, but um, being a satellite mission, it can have overlapping bands and um, the low L, the reionization pump. Difficulty is uh, it's a space mission with a single goal, uh, and you know, usually you don't, you don't have enough mouth to feed. It's not very popular, but it's an uh, important enough mission. Um, they're, they're still optimistic that it could be successful. But the time scale of that is. Uh, So because I'm not a student, uh, I'm not familiar with astronomy. Then I just have one question. The question is that when you want to, like, when you are going to uh, subtract the background, the dust background from the, from the plant data. So what is the potential model when you, you use to convert the information from the plant to subtract your background and your rest of the data? What is the model you use? Okay. So we're not subtracting a model, we're just subtracting a map, actually. So before the subtraction, you multiply a factor corresponding to the scale factor from 353 gigahertz to 150. So dust, the microwave background, microwave background, black body. body uh, modulo the opacity, but at a much higher temperature. So this is 3 Kelvin, from 7 Kelvin, this is like 20 Kelvin. So you know, we know the spectral dependence quite well. So from 353, scaled down to uh, 150, um, it just depends on the temperature of the dust. So you just multiply by that scale factor, so basically, it's just a black body radiation from of the dust. Yeah, okay. but a black body radiation that we only measure in two places, in two frequencies. Just to, you know, there are other you know maps, but the, <coughs> those contributed much less in weight than at 353. Any more questions? Okay, see your last chance.